on the vault. High atop the pastoral center of the Diocese of Camden, you're listening to Talking Catholic. Hi, everyone. Thanks for listening to Talking Catholic. This is your co-host, Mary McCusker, and I'm here with Mike Walsh. And I think this is our first recording of summer 2021. It's It's June 25th, so it dawned on me that Christmas is in six months, which is a very weird thing to consider. Isn't that peculiar? Uh, You're absolutely right. I, my wife mentioned something about it yesterday, and I was like, it can't be six months of Christmas. Yep. And sure enough, when she turned on QVC when we got home, they were doing all of their <laughs> summer in June, July stuff. So Yeah, the yeah. year is half over. Or what's well, that? Not quite. Uh, cup half full, whatever. However you want to look at it. <laughs> okay. 2021 is a weird year. You know what it seems to me? Like, it is definitely a Friday, and you and I are in, our brains are in Friday mode, yeah, I that, think. Yeah, that's about right. But it's also a beautiful day outside. I, it was thrilled driving over here where we're actually recording in Catholic Charities today, which I, you know, I love coming over here to record because you guys bring me with such joy. It's my second time being here this week because uh, we have a new addition to our Catholic Star Herald family of which the Talking Catholic is a uh, Talking Catholic podcast is a part of. Um, the Catholic Star Herald is the diocesan newspaper for the Diocese of Camden, uh, covering all of South Jersey. And uh, we announced this week the uh, transition at the top Um, Our beloved and long-serving managing editor, Carl Peters, has announced his retirement. And this week we brought on board uh, our new managing editor, Jennifer Morrow, uh, in the past of the uh, many uh, secular newspapers, but also the Trenton Monitor in the Diocese of Trenton. And uh, so she joined us this week. So I was mm-hmm. over here. We'd ha- we had a lovely little sit down with a lot of your directors over here at Catholic Charities. Yep. And it was lovely giving her a tour and, you know, seeing people back in the office and present is always really nice. Good yeah. switch from whatever a Zoom tour would look like, but it was lovely to meet her. Yeah, she's a delight. She's a, to, to, we gave her a baptism by fire by having a uh, having a uh, addition coming out this week. But fortunately, Carl is uh, sticking around for a couple of weeks during the transition period, yep. and then uh, he'll be leaving us in mid July, we believe, and then uh, it'll be all Jen's job. So, uh, but she's a great, and we are going to have her on the podcast soon and do a little sit down with her. And I'm I, I'm our reclusive that's not really true but our our, <laughs> our very quiet uh outgoing managing editor carl peters whom we love um I don't, we'll have not, to rope him on here at some point yeah he has been on once before uh he, yeah back in the old days we had him on oh, uh, with that. our photographer our long-serving photographer jim mcbride at the time we had them do an episode together but uh, i think we're gonna have uh carl on one more time he, he usually does his best to avoid microphones, but uh, I think we and might any be able to... spotlight in general. But yes, no, there we can convince him. <laughs> there is no more humble man on the the planet than uh, Carl Peters. It's but true. there's also very few writers as as great as he. I know. Uh, yep. Mary's been Mary's wept since he announced his uh, his departure. <laughs> she was I'm tearing up as we speak. <laughs> virtually inconsolable when when he let us know. But um, he's uh, if you have never read his columns, they're phenomenal. They they can all be found in the Catholic Star Herald dot uh, org. And um, he writes from a pers- he doesn't write from a perspective news pers- per se, but he finds these incredible stories of around the world of people who are not necessarily Catholic or not Catholic in any way, shape, or form, or for that matter, not even spiritual, but how their lives were impacted by these spiritual events um, and how they themselves, even possibly as as, as atheists found themselves incredibly touched by things that we in the Catholic Church might find somewhat pedestrian. And they're always a great reminder of, you know, the power of the the simple things of our faith. Um, and the everyday things, you know, he's roped in music, film, literature, everything imaginable, and somehow yeah. ties it into our faith. I've, there's really no writer like him. There really he's isn't. He's one it's, of the best. He'll, he won't. He doesn't send me his stuff before he, it appears on the page for editing, and uh, but he did. He'll, he will send me a, write, a rundown of what he's planning to write. And one of the things he sent me re- recently just had the word Linda Ronstadt next to it. And I was I, right there. I'm engaged. I'm like, what could he be writing about that connects Linda Ronstadt to oh, something? I don't even the, know who that of is. Our, of our Catholic faith, <laughs> she's a very famous uh, singer from uh, the 70s and 80s. Huh. But um, but anyway, I'm genuinely looking forward to it. So and he yeah. has promised for anyone who's a big Carl. Peters fan already, even though he's stepping down from his roles as a managing editor, uh, he will be continuing to submit articles from uh, 
to us um, Thank God for in that. perpetuity. <laughs> so as a matter of fact, when he met with Bishop Sullivan and uh, just to let him know that he was retiring, uh, Bishop Sullivan was, was happy to essentially order him to continue writing for us. So, <laughs> Can't uh, say no to Bishop. <laughs> no, no. So we're very excited about that. Yep. Speaking of uh, things where people aren't allowed to say no, uh, you somehow uh, buttonholed our two guests uh, for today. And, and who do yes. we have with us and why do we have them with us? So today um, we have uh, Stephanie Meckel and Jerry Grant, or Jerome Grant. Um, both of them uh, work here at Catholic Charities, and I'll invite them to use their titles because I'll probably mess them up. But um, they're both relatively new. I think they joined us within the past year or so, and they have just such great energy and you know our our staff i think jerry joined us uh as an intern stephanie joined us also as an intern but is now an employee here and um they're very much ingrained in in the work we do every day and i think everybody sees them as you know a, a really great asset to to catholic charity so welcome stephanie and welcome jerry um jerry can you let's start with you can you uh, introduce yourself and your title and maybe a little bit about what you do and then we'll introduce Stephanie. Sure. Um, my name is Jerry Grant. I am a social work intern from Fordham University and um, I'm actually in the accelerated program at Fordham University, which is a Jesuit institute. Yes. They, Love um, the Jesuits. <laughs> yeah. Um, I am in the accelerated program, so what normally takes two and a half years to get your master's degree, I'm going to be doing in 16 months. Wow. Yeah. That sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> it is. And, uh, and, and I, I started my internship here on January 4th of this year. Wow. Wow. So it's, it's always great to start an internship mid-pandemic. That's always like, <laughs> yeah, right. That's what I'm talking about. I didn't about. meet you yeah. in person until just a, a couple months ago. It was all through Zoom, and then I bumped into you one day. I said, oh. You're that guy from Zoom. <laughs> I, I'm a lot shorter in person. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome, Jerry. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for and having me. And we also have Stephanie Meckel. Hi. So um, I'm Stephanie. Nicole, I'm sorry, no, Stephanie. No, that's okay. Don't worry about it. It happens a lot. Um, so I am a case manager in the Family Center. And um, before that, I was an intern. Uh, I mostly intern in the clinical services and adoptions department. Um, so I started that... August of last year so it's almost been a year which is crazy wow. it went by really fast yeah. um, and it is crazy I started at home and then transitioning to the office and seeing people was so <laughs> different wow. and weird but it's, it's really cool to be in the office now yeah um, yeah and so I'm entering my second year for my master's of social work program at Rutgers nice mm. yeah I didn't know that <laughs> <laughs> so can you tell us Stephanie a little bit about the work you do here at Catholic Charities, is there an average day for Stephanie or is it a little bit different? It's definitely a little bit different. Um, so as a case manager, um, we get a lot of phone calls from people just about various needs, um, especially since COVID, it's been a lot of um, calls about assisting with like back rent, um, utility and just various needs. Um, so a lot of times I'm contacting clients and just figuring out how we could be most helpful to them. Um, and also just collaborating with different people in different departments um, in order to help them best. Um, and I screen them for the funding we get from the state just to see if they qualify for our assistance. So yeah, it's a lot of talking to clients, talking to different landlords, utility companies, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you always sound so pleasant. <laughs> Thank <laughs> now you. Now and always. <laughs> so I'm thinking if I were a client, I would like to hear your voice at the other end because that first encounter is always so right. important when people reach out during a time that's really really difficult for them and like you said the pandemic how yeah. how has that been like what are most people calling about and it, I mean I, I mean I wasn't doing the work before the pandemic so I can't say oh, what right. it was like before that but I, I do know we get a, a lot of calls so it is difficult seeing that there are so many people that are in need at this time, um, but just trying to do my best, like getting back to people as fast as possible. But like you said, people often call, they're stressed, they're worried. Right. So just trying to do the best we can to either help them through our agency or connect them to whatever other resources they right. need. And do you just work in our Camden County Center? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Great. And 
let's switch over to Jerry. Jerry, can you tell us a little bit about what you do? I, I do a little bit of, of everything. <laughs> uh, I actually started off my internship. I report directly to Mr. Hickey, Kevin Hickey, the executive director. And my initial assignment when I started was to develop a program based off the universal basic income um, theories that are out there. And so the, the really the first half of my internship was almost 100% that, learning about universal basic income or UBI, uh, learning about guaranteed incomes, GI, or uh, cash transfers. There's a, a whole bunch of different names to it, but I've, I've read a lot more than I ever thought. I didn't even know what UBI was when I started here. So yeah. to to be thrown into that crucible of learning um, in addition to my regular schooling was, right. was a little bit of a challenge, but I was able to do that here. So I did the majority of my learning that particular thing uh, here. Right. Yeah. So for anybody listening, um, like you, I've been doing a ton of research about this too, ever since Kevin Hickey brought it up. Um, and I know it takes a lot of, it looks different in, you know, different countries and wherever it's implemented, it looks a little different, but can you tell us a little bit about what it basically is or what it aims to do? Okay. So in 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 the broadest sense, a universal basic income, it would be a guaranteed cash payment to every citizen, regardless of income, regardless of whether they're working or not. And it would be, it would basically be their, their bottom line salary to sustain their life living here. Mm -hmm. Um, It wouldn't necessarily, the, the programs that are out there right now aren't enough to keep people from being able to not work so they're not a sit around and do nothing type of income but they are enough to supplement what you do make so that you're not hand to mouth every single week or every single month you've you've got a a little bit of a cushion some breathing room that that's basically what a a universal income yeah and i know it's a topic of uh, a lot of debate, you know, I'm sure, but at, here in South Jersey, what was the, was there a certain goal, um, a certain demographic? I know there was, it was modeled around the program called uh, Jersey Grit. Can you tell us about that a little? All right, so, so this program that I've been uh, trying to develop is called Jersey Grit, and it's um, based out of Atlantic City. Initially, we were looking at, uh, at a particular demographic uh, based in the gaming industry there. Um, and that that's kind of where we were, we were mm-hmm. looking. Uh, yeah. The way things are going right now with this shift in the way the government is handling the, the pandemic crisis and, and unemployment and everything else, I'm really, I'm, I'm taking a step back to see how much of a difference our program will make sure um because it's going to be really hard to measure the effect of our program with the influx of all these other programs that are very similar to it the the tax rebates that are going to be going out now on a regular basis uh the extra cash incentives that have been sent out from for children, mm-hmm. lift, really, with the intention of lifting children out of poverty. So, if you have a if you have a kid that's under eighteen, you should have gotten like fourteen hundred dollars in the last couple weeks, right? Uh, because of these programs. And moving forward, based on what uh, President Biden has just done, uh, people are going to be getting around two hundred and fifty dollars per child under the age of eighteen every single month as a preemptive tax rebate. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what the guaranteed income was supposed to accomplish, was right. to give a little bit of, of a boost. So this stuff is like enormously complicated. You know, you, you read about relief from the government during the pandemic and, you know, there's good things about that. There's, you know, challenges that come with it. I think a lot of people are confused <laughs> more than anything. Um 
but at you know it's this if there's anything i've seen during this pandemic it's you know the the government only goes so far before people come to a, to a nonprofit to a charity through our doors in need of help um and i think that's kind of what distinguishes catholic charities from um you know any we're not the government you know when when people come in we try our best to to help them um even if it's just pointing them in the right direction but um i know that a lot of people have come to our doors throughout the pandemic and especially in atlantic city which i can see why the program would you know start there because like you said the the gaming industry there i have family both sides of fa- of my family who live in that area and they they're all employed by the casinos um another thing specific to atlantic city so you know when they close or when uh super hurricane sandy strikes you know atlantic city's a definitely resilient place but a you know there's a lot of needs there for sure yeah and and you know that's it's probably a good point to interject that um you know i, I think there's this there's always this hope when when a society goes through a, something similar to what the uh the pandemic has been that you know everything will go back to normal immediately and the truth of the matter is there are ripple effects that last for years i mean famously you know we've been we catholic charities has been providing still continues to this day to provide assistance to people who were affected by superstorm sandy and that was 2012 right. you know that's yep. 11 it's nine years ago now and Ter- with the recession math, but, in 2008 yeah. the people mm-hmm. have been laid off and then just found themselves buried in debt Right. who've lost their homes and are still trying to pick up the pieces however many years later. And casinos were toppling over like dominoes beginning right. in around 2014. And Atlantic City has the highest unemployment rate in all of New Jersey. Really? Yeah. Yes, mm-hmm. by 20%. Not just South Jersey, all of New Jersey? All of New Jersey. Wow, I did uh, not know that. Atlantic City had already been in the United States among the, the highest unemployment rates and after the pandemic, when all the hospitality industry shot down, Atlantic City's employment rate dropped below the national average by about 20%. And I only know this because of the program that I've been trying to, you know, right. look into seeing if, if we can sustain. Sure. Uh, so it's, it's definitely a need. And a thing I forgot to mention about it was that a universal basic income or a guaranteed cash transfer One of the key points of it is that it isn't like welfare Mm -hmm. and that there aren't any hoops to jump through. You don't have to be uh, particularly destitute. You don't have to you don't have to have a particular job or not have a particular job. There's there's literally nothing preventing you or or required of you to get the cash Mm -hmm. you're you're autonomous in your spending nobody's going to tell you how to spend it or not spend it you do with it what you want right so So the jersey grip program i think no wait a second let's let's just uh i think it's important to clarify something right now this is a program that you've been investigating this is not a program that is currently available for people living in south jersey correct correct that it it is not available (laughs) yeah i don't want to get anyone to be listening to getting their hopes up and saying oh Oh, gosh Catholic charities (laughs) has not implemented this program yet it's still in its infancy Mm -hmm. uh People that are curious about types of programs like this can always go to, uh, they can look up the, uh, the uh, Stockton Economic uh, Empowerment, um, what is it, what is the D stand, I always forget what the D stands for, demonstration, <laughs> uh-huh. um, or mayors for a guaranteed income, because they're the ones that are typically, they have the largest amount of programs that are guaranteed incomes or cash transfers. There's there's a couple dozen of them now across the United States, and uh, they all have different focuses and different demographics, but they're all based off the, the idea that they shouldn't be uh, micromanaged by anybody that people should be allowed to be autonomous in their spending mm-hmm. and and identifying their own needs rather than somebody telling them what their needs are and then kind of p- pushing them into a, a pigeonhole that's really interesting I yeah, mean, and, it's a- and these are these are thoughts that have really been these 
these kinds of philosophies on um, assistance have been out there for decades. Right. Um, but sort of as, you know, society's evolved over the last, you know, several years, um, you know, they're, they're starting to gain a lot more traction. These new concepts that are, are kind of, you know, antithetical to how you would have expected uh, governments or NGOs to be providing assistance back in the day. So, you know, it's they're, they're great things to certainly research. They're great things to look into ways of, of implementing. Um, but the truth of the matter is, you know, for anyone who's listening and, and might be feeling they, they, they have this is something they need. You know, there are some programs out there that for that, but it's, it's, there's still a lot, there's a big learning curve in all of this. And, right. and in our case in the state of New Jersey, you know, getting, you know, state governments, federal governments to sort of embrace ideas like this. And there's going to be pushback as well. I mean, there right. are some people that have not a big fan of, of, of these kinds of concepts. So, um, you know, it'll but it's be worth exploring. You it know, is. our goal is to lift and actually, people out of poverty right. and there's a million theories about how to do that, yeah. but you know, and that's one of the good things about Catholic charities is that uh, it has the ability to look into these other opportunities that you just wouldn't be able to a state government or a federal government wouldn't be able to quickly pivot to then maybe something like Catholic charities could provide, you know, if the, if the funding can be found and if the need can be addressed. Right. So, um, so that's, that's kind of, that's kind of fascinating, but you know, listening to the two of you speak er, uh, earlier, I, it got me to thinking that I, I happen to be friends with quite a few social workers and I've been working with social workers for most of my adult career um, which always brings me back to the the same question: What were you people thinking? Why are you becoming social workers? <laughs> so, that was my parents say the same thing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, Steph, let's 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 talk a little bit about that. What uh, what kind of brought you to this sort of area of wanting to be a social worker? Um. So it's a good question, but I I kind of case case management, um, what I'm doing now isn't uh, exactly what I want to be doing, I don't think. I think I want to go more towards um, like therapy and counseling. Uh, I've always had an interest in working with children, so that's kind of what I hope to do um, later in life is doing counseling therapy for children, um, focus in maybe like grief or trauma. And it just kind of came from, uh, in my undergrad, I did, I was a human services major, which is kind of like social work. Um, they just didn't have the program, but I had professors that were social workers and just hearing the work that they did with children and just throughout their lives was really interesting to me. Um, yeah, so I'm kind of looking forward to exploring, like social work is so broad. So right. just getting the case management experience now and then maybe doing like therapy in the future. I'm, just looking forward to all the different avenues, I guess. Well, that's that's one of the beauties of uh, social work is that there are there are in fact so many different ways of entering that field. Right. Uh, I happen to be friends with one, uh, very good friends with a with a person who does social work for um, uh, fostering and adoption, and oftentimes, like I'll be having a tough day at work or, uh, you know, it's, it's been, you know, something crazy has happened and, uh, I'll be on the phone with this person and they'll go and they'll tell me it's something that happened during their day. And I'll go, you know what? You've made me feel so much better about my own job because I can't <laughs> believe some of the stuff that, that happens in the, I mean, these right. truly horrific things that happen to, to people, uh, through no fault of their own, just life has hit them in a certain way. Right. And, um, you know, having a social worker there who can help them sort of manage that process and, 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 and find the next step, find the help that they need is, in, is incredibly important, particularly and there's so many very, like we said before, there's so many different things that social workers actually work on. But, you know, when you start getting into like federal and state governments, they're also so intricate that you have to know your right. way, your way around them. So, Steph, what, what are you working in again right now? Um, in the family center. I'm a case manager. OK, so, so like what different kinds of state you know, interaction might you have now? Like what kind of programs would you be working with? So the biggest funding we get is, is called SSH. Um, I couldn't really tell you what it stands for at the moment. <laughs> the SHUSH grant is what <laughs> yeah. I've always heard. <laughs> right. Um, and so there's two avenues of that, SSH State, which is usually just for like single individuals, and then um, SSH TANF, which is for families usually. So that's usually the biggest funding that can go towards back rent, utility payments, things like that. Um, so we, me and my supervisor, Sylvia, do have a lot of interaction with like state reps for that and stuff like that about how the funding should be sent, uh, spent, um, the qualifications for that, and just going over how to qualify people because we want to qualify people right like you want to sure. get the funding to them so what can we do to qualify people and get them the funding right. now now Steph seems to be taking more of a classic 
um, route to social work. And every social worker I've ever met also always goes for their master's degree. I'm, I'm beginning <laughs> to think that it's much more of an important thing for, for social workers than I ever realized. Uh, and I, as I'm sure, it, it probably has a lot to do with salary. Right. But um, so Don't make assumptions. Maybe some people just want to <laughs> learn more. For the education. Listen, yeah. I, yes, exactly. I have a master's degree, and I absolutely got a master's degree because I knew it would help my salary. Oh, gosh. And, I'm the only one has. who just has a oh, bachelor's that's not true. in this room. Excuse me. I keep sending you uh, stuff to look into master's degrees. Right, for communication. And it's just very, well, we're not, well, oh, let's hey, not go down my. Uh, it's not my fault that you have an incredible skill set and I'm looking for ways of cultivating that. So dear listeners, if you'd like to encourage Mary to go to a, to get her master's degree from someplace like mm-hmm. Penn or Columbia or Georgetown. Mike, or I just Peabot. turned 29 this week and I realized I'm supposed to have my life together by now. No, like, you're not. This is, and now wow, I'm that, just stung. That is so I'm not 54, true. I'm <laughs> yeah. and I just started a master's program. Which, and which you, I, I might I, add. As, no, no, you keep your foot in your mouth for a second, um, <laughs> which is why I was kind of going down this road. So, so Stephanie is 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 quite a bit younger than myself and and Jerry, and not, not so much maybe than Mary anymore. But because um, Mary just had her 29th birthday, oh. but Jerry, you've taken a slightly longer path. Different path, maybe a way to describe it. As yes. A, as a as a more seasoned intern, let's call it that. So my my social service work really actually kind of started as a soldier, uh, and I was uh, National Guard for a few years when I was younger. I went inactive, ready reserves for a, a long time, and then came back into the National Guard uh, in July of two thousand one. Ooh. Oh, wow. With the intent what of going year. to college and then moving back to Arizona and working for Intel Corporation, because mm-hmm. that's who I'd been working for before. Anyway, long story short, 9-11. Right. Right. And everything changed. Uh, deployments to bridges and tunnels initially for the National Guard. And then just a couple years later, there we are going into Iraq and then Afghanistan. Uh, along that route, I got activated um, volunteered to go to Iraq and then ended up at McGuire Air Force Base for a couple of years uh, working as security forces because they were deploying uh, and securing air bases and stuff in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And then uh, I ended up becoming full-time National Guard and I, wow. and I just liked it. I liked serving soldiers and, and making sure that these, these men and women that were putting their lives on the line got the best possible um, service that they could get regardless of the role that I was in. Um, I was medically retired in 2019 Mm -hmm. and, uh, had been doing, uh, at that time, foster care for about three years or so. Uh, my wife and I have been doing foster care. So uh, I, I started wondering what, you know, what does it look like? I'm at the time I'm 52, you know, what am I going to do? I'm too young to really retire. So I need to do something with my time. But my wife had been kind of pushing us to read more about trauma Mm. and how children are affected by trauma, uh, particularly in foster care. And so we just started reading different books on childhood trauma and how to talk to children so they'll listen and how to listen to children and you know how to how to navigate children's trauma and we've we've read a lot of different books and there there were a few that really stood out to me Uh, one of them was the boy who was raised as a dog which is a series of stories somebody recently mentioned that Uh, Sylvia Lemoot probably mentioned that Lamo probably <laughs> mentioned yeah, Lamo. I mess it up too. <laughs> Lamo. <laughs> Sorry, Sylvia, if you're listening. <laughs> uh, so, Sylvia Lamo actually mentioned it because one of the things Catholic Charities here is doing is is becoming more and more trauma informed. Mm-hmm. It's really been um, part of the conversation in in almost daily activity right. here is being trauma informed, dealing with the with the. Uh, customers that we have mm-hmm. that are that are looking for services. Right. Um, anyway, my wife and I wanted to become trauma informed foster parents. We wanted to be the best foster mommy and daddy for the week or the month or the year or whatever it was we were going to have these children in our care. 
And a natural outcropping of that was, well, I'm reading all the books. Why don't I just go to school for it? Yeah. And that's how I started my social work that's master's a, degree. Wow. Yeah. I didn't know. I didn't know any of that. That is quite the path to uh, to social work. Although right. I, I absolutely understand it. I do. It's weird. I, I know quite a few um, former military who who end up in social work, and I I think it's a sense of service. It, I think it is. It yeah. tends to be what it is. So I think there's a natural inclination to that. Right. Um, but but that's that's fantastic. And what and, you mentioned. And wait, how did you end up at Fordham? I actually interviewed. Because I've been in therapy myself. I've been a consumer, not just a purveyor. <laughs> You're and, not alone. It's good to both sides. That, that right. was actually a little bit of the, uh, some of the first seeds that were planted were in my own therapeutic experiences and, and things that I'd been dealing with um, that were like, hmm, this is a nice way to help people overcome their hangups and addictions and fears and traumas and everything else and it's it planted the seeds and then having having trauma under my roof mm-hmm. uh in the form of children was was kind of the tipping point yeah yeah and we we hear i feel like almost every day i hear somebody at, at catholic charity say something something trauma-informed care um and i know that it's something that you know sylvia and kevin are, are very big on having all staff trained in trauma-informed care including me at one point a few years ago i said why on earth do i need to to learn this and you know of course i you meet went, with clients all the time well, right well okay so this was like when i first started working here yeah. and i'm picturing like but then i really quickly realized how important it was when you're talking when i'm telling their stories and mm-hmm. speaking with them and you know there is it really does come into play and it's so important some people um, who aren't familiar with trauma-informed care kind of roll their eyes like, oh, so you just have to be extra nice to everyone. But it's just so much more it's, than it's that. It's a considering the whole person, not right. just a, a specific need, right? It right. is what is what is your story? What, what has happened to you right. that got you here? Yeah. And looking at people with that kind of compassion is – Uh, They might need more than a drink of water. Right. They may need, you know, Jesus reached out to the leper and he touched him. He didn't be like, you're healed, now go away. Right, right. He he would touch him, you know. And there's, so there's a trauma-informed people are, to me, are going to have a little more empathy. They're going to have a little more compassion um, because they're not just, meeting a specific need right. they're 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 looking at the whole person right is yeah. that something you've seen stephanie in, yeah in definitely your work? I, th- I think one of the biggest things too is just like you said like listening to their trauma and just listening to what they need um from you or in their lives it's just so important because especially when you've been through trauma as a child or even in your adult life you you aren't always listened to you are always aren't cared for in the best way so just yeah listening to them tell you what they need is right. definitely the first step yeah and a, so I've interviewed a number of clients who've revealed a lot of trauma and 90% of it, you know, they say, don't, this is off the record, right? Mm-hmm. You're not going to post in mm-hmm. the article. So a lot of the stories I've told about clients who've had success through Catholic charities, what what's not in this story, and it's obviously, you, first thing is to respect their privacy, but there's oftentimes so many layers of trauma and after these interviews sometimes I've just gone into the nearest empty room and just cried afterwards I'm like oh my gosh so I want to know how do you both handle that when you hear about people's trauma I mean is there a certain way to cope with that I've always I always love asking social workers that question how do you deal with it how do you not get burnt out from this work (laughs) <laughs> well, it's I guess it's definitely different for everyone. Like everyone has their own like hobbies, like people like going to the gym or mm. whatever they do. But I think the part I like about it the most is like working with people like Jerry or Sylvia. Like we're able to sit down and talk about that. Like they they kind of know where you're coming from because they're they're in the same role. Um, so being being able to collaborate and just kind of sit down and be like, you know, I had a hard day listening to this client right. today. Um, and yeah, just taking time for yourself, whatever that might be, going to the gym, painting, whatever. Um, and just realizing too, like this is starting to get to me. So what right. can I do to like take the step back? Right. 
because you you do hear stories about social workers who enter with the best intentions, but then after a year, they're like, nope, nope, I can't do this anymore. Right. <laughs> so, they do talk about burnout a lot in, right. in my program. I don't know about you, Jerry, but they, they always talk about that in my classes, like yeah. how, how to self-care and burnout and things like that. Right. So. Yeah, self-care is definitely important. Being able to talk it talk it out, you know, talk out the things that we've experienced or heard or seen is super important. Therapists need therapists. Right. Yeah. We need the opportunity to step back and catch our breath and kind of detach for a little bit and take care of ourselves sure. first um, because a empty pitcher can't fill another cup. I was about to say, isn't there some <laughs> saying with filling your own cup so you're able to yeah. fill out some? Yep, that was it. <laughs> yeah, and, so and you got so you got to fill your you got to fill your own cup before you can fill somebody else's. Right. See, so, that's why I just say an empty pitcher. Then I don't have to worry about it. It's, it's so much <laughs> well, easier. Just, that's why. Oh, I you just stay, stay an, an empty. I, I just stay an empty pitcher, and I don't have to worry about it because <laughs> I'm I got that, nothing Mike, in there but, anyway. But it's like you know. Oh, you know the truth. <laughs> well, then you come to Catholic Charities and you hear from wonder pe- wonderful people. Yeah, like I do. And then I'm amazed and that these and... people exist. And I'm like, oh, thank goodness they're here because I'm not going to do it. So, <laughs> I'm, I'm, no, it, it is it is true. You know, I it, so f- I, I my the first nonprofit I worked with in the early 2000s, you know, it was all actually even all the executives, much like here, all the executives were former social workers, mm-hmm. um, case managers and, and that like. And it really does. They had... It, the best i will admit that the the best bosses i've ever had are people that have worked in this sort of world because i i know we have fancy terms for for things like this and understanding trauma and whatnot but the truth of the matter was if you break it down to its brass tacks it's, it's truly understanding the person that you're having this interaction with which as someone who didn't who is not a social worker it's sometimes difficult for me to remember as i'm preparing to tear their head off because they've <laughs> failed me in some ways and that I have to remember that you know they probably have their own struggles there's probably a reason why something has happened or hasn't happened um, and it behooves me to understand where they're coming from it's not to say there aren't metrics that are supposed to be met but you know it, it does it does the world a lot of good if you stop for a moment and think about the place that the other person is in. And, and I think that is, you know, at some point we probably should, however, have an entire conversation on self care. I I know that's something we talked to Sylvia Lameau, by the way, we keep talking about Sylvia. What's Sylvia's title? Oh gosh. She wears so many hats. Director of clinical services at Catholic charities. She oversees the adoption program. Um, SSH. Counseling, yes, works. Um, she she runs the Family and Community Service Center in in Camden County. Here, she's a genius. She does yeah, a, she, a, pretty much. She's everything. great. Yeah, she she truly knows everything there is to know about social work. Everything about the, the programs that exist here now, the programs that existed here. 20 years ago as well. She's been here a long time. Uh, I don't know where her energy comes from. She's another one of these social workers that just blows me away every time I'm around her because right. her level of caring appears to have not ebbed at all since she started. Right. Uh, her knowledge base has certainly grown exponentially. She's one of those people that would be next to impossible to replace if she was ever gone. Um, oh, and, don't even say that. <laughs> I won't. I want to think about um, that. But, but the truth of the matter is the service she provides is phenomenal. Mm-hmm. And uh, but anyway, I say all that to say this. I think we do need to have an episode just on self care at some right. point because people it, picture it as like cucumbers on the eyes and like you know some spa. Like that is the know, only that, way I ever want to be around a cucumber. Uh, do you know what I mean? Yes. I mean, I dare type it in Google self care, and you know these images are conjured spa of days like, and things like that. Which I'm sure there's a place for that, but yeah. like Stephanie and Jerry mentioned, it so much of it is able to share with people who understand you know and everybody has their outlets but i think that's part of the beauty here at catholic charities is you aren't alone Mm -hmm. here and you know honestly that's something that's we've all gone through this pandemic experience and people have had you know different experiences as part of it um i know for a fact i had to apologize to somebody at work i was taking someone on a tour recently and i realized at the end after i took them around all the buildings i realized that i was rather acerbic and sarcastic even more than i usually am 
And I just wanted to let that person know who was a new hire that said, listen, you know, this is a great place to work. This is a, a, you know, the people here are wonderful. They're all angels. And they truly are. If you've ever wondered who works at the diocese and Catholic charities, it is truly angelic human beings, saintly people. Oh, gosh. Um, it, not you, but other people. Um, <laughs> I knew. But, <laughs> but uh, me neither. Not, We're not all neither. humans here. The but, social, the people who work here are really really incredible and it's messy work right like it's not kevin always says i I, oh gosh i hope he doesn't listen to this because i can't remember which pope said this but like we belong in that messiness you know Mm -hmm. um when when it comes to trauma-informed care you know recognizing okay this person has been through a whole lot um how did they end up like this? And, you know, you ask all those questions and you're certainly empathetic and, and caring, but then it's like, well, I'm sure you've run into the, that question of, you know, well, how much should I push this person, you know, to get where they should be while still showing empathy? You know, there's a lot of that gray area. And Kevin always said, that's where we belong is in that, muck for lack of a better word and i think yeah. pope francis said something yeah that effect. I, I, yeah he's always talked about you know wanting the smell of the sheep a pastor wants to have the, the smell of the sheep on them and uh as a shepherd you need to have the smell of the sheep oh on yes you. yes um <laughs> I can't hear, all i heard was something something sheep so <laughs> well it's always good actually i was watching a movie a tv show last night all about sheep but it's a different, that's well, a different story um the uh, it was about farming it was about sheep farming the uh, why I was have i watching questions for you ask okay. after this podcast but <laughs> <laughs> i can tell you right now there's a tv show called top gear that was on in on the bbc for years and years and years and then the toast got booted from uh, bbc america or bbc and now they have this other thing called uh, uh the grand tour that's with uh amazon prime and uh as part of their contract with amazon prime each of these hosts get these other series and this one host uh now has his own farm and uh it's showing him learning how to farm huh. and, and ranch apparently because now he has sheep so that's where that a guy by the name of jeremy clarkson it was very funny huh. you um, took a break from your baking shows i'm, I'm glad to hear that <laughs> I, think I, I think i've watched every baking show that's uh, oh, available you've exhausted all of them. i think i have so i'm i'm gonna um we're actually you and i are working on a project right now as a matter of yes. fact for a cooking show it's uh, in the works no spoilers yeah no, no i'm not gonna let it out but uh, god willing we're gonna have a cooking show for this catholic charities in the next couple of months and uh i could not be more excited i've decided that now that i've watched every cooking show that's out there i'm we, we need to start making our own because you know that's, I think that's your real calling in, Mike. Forget PR and communications. Yeah, well, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> well, uh, one of the questions I wanted to ask um, for both of you is what's what's the most challenging parts of your work? And then what are your favorite parts or the most rewarding? So I can who go. wants to start? <laughs> um, I think I've kind of mentioned this before. The most challenging part is definitely just, especially now with the pandemic, there are so many people that are in need. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, you go into this job to help people. So I, it's hard to leave at the end of the day knowing that there's still people out there that I need to call back and there's right. still people in need. Um, again, it goes with self-care. You know, you, at the end of the day, you just got to go home and come back the next day ready to go. Right. Um, But my favorite part is I love talking to people. So just getting to talk to people, even though they are in this hard part of their life, just talking to them. Um, And they are always so, so nice on the phone, you know, like even though they are stressed out and they're going through this hard time, I I really love talking to them. Um, And the people I work with, I love working here and just getting to talk to everyone, not only about the work, but their lives and yeah. Great answer. (laughs) She's very enthusiastic. When you said everyone's nice on the phone, I think that's probably because of the way you speak with them. Like I said, you always sound so pleasant and like kind. And it's just so important. That first phone call, that first encounter is always just can kind of make or break how somebody feels. Right. But how about you, Jerry? Favorite? Least favorite? Least favorite and, and challenging, I, I have to agree with Stephanie, is is uh, just knowing and, and seeing firsthand the amount of need mm-hmm. that's out there. And it, it sometimes it feels like I'm trying to fill a colander mm-hmm. yeah. as a yeah. vessel. You know what I mean? And you can't. You can't fill a colander with water. It's designed to not hold it. Right, right. So sometimes it feels like that. It feels like, you know, what, what am I doing? Mm-hmm. Um, 
The other really bad thing about being here is the commute. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, uh oh, what's he gonna say? Yeah, <laughs> I, I I actually live in Bridgeton, uh, Upper Deerfield, New why. Jersey, which is supposed to be forty minutes away. And <laughs> sometimes the commute between fifty five, forty two, and two ninety five just absolutely dries up, and it becomes a parking lot, and it's. <sighs> It's, uh, well, that was definitely the case this morning. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was near. not very good this yeah, morning. This morning was particularly After, bad. Probably half you're hour. Coming from minutes. that direction, too, yeah, right, Mike? I come up from Glassboro. Although I will say, I was down in Bridgeton uh, the other day. I was uh, actually in Lower Alloways, or as I like to call it, Lower Lower Alloways. It was even below Alloway. And it's even uh, below Bridgeton. Yeah, that's but pretty far south. I was right on the bay side of uh, which I never get to go to. But I've I've had family in that those parts for yeah. years and years and years, and I lo- I love that section of South Jersey because I mean that's. That's I lo- belo- I lovingly say that part of sec- uh, you could literally take that part of South Jersey up and move it to Alabama and nobody would know <laughs> the difference. It is that kind of it's yeah. It's, but I love it. I think it's it fantastic. has character. It has a lot of Southern character. It's technically below the, uh, the Mason, Mason Dixon, Dixon line. Yeah, right? mm. that's always my fun fact. I like to sprinkle around and people. No, it's not. I'm like, look it up. <laughs> we, are, we are essentially in the South here. Yeah. When but, you said 55 to 42, I almost broke out in hives, Jerry. I have I. And the occasions where I do come, that one lane, uh, when it narrows down, and if the sun during rush hour is coming a certain way, like, and oh, people I can't not knowing how to it. merge properly. Oh, gosh, the merging. Yeah. <laughs> like, there's a merge point, people. Stop trying to get into the, into hey, the line. Hey, listen, we need back. to have a podcast. That's a different <laughs> podcast. Well, hold on. I'm just going to say, let's be kind to our Pennsylvania drivers. They, oh, we all uh, know it's them. I wasn't going to say it. I'm not going to mention Maryland either. Just saying. <laughs> don't get me started. I don't know on why not everybody in Maryland, only New Jerseyans know how to drive for some reason. Right. Yeah, like the left yet. lane is for 85 and up. Yes. Yep. Hello. And God have mercy on you if you are going the speed limit in oh, the left yeah. lane. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my my favorite part, um, the the best thing about here so far, again, is you know just to echo Stephanie, is so many of the people uh, that I've encountered have been great. Um, I've watched the um, unplanned compassion and empathy from Gisela and Shantae oh, yeah, who I, I their their desks are kind of near mine and so sometimes I overhear them working through things with the people they're talking to on the phone and they're just they're super patient mm-hmm. you know and they they constantly have a good attitude right, right. Um, so that's been good um, the other good thing for me is I've had a very broad experience compared to your typical intern i've i've had access to the executive director mm-hmm. i've had access to all the directors of different programs um i've been in the trenches with ssh and working with clients that are in need mm-hmm. i've been able to experience counseling people i've worked with the veteran side of the house as well in um rebecca and, and done some veterans visits with rebecca who is also very compassionate oh yeah and it, and it's and it's all all the compassion is it's like a natural overflow of their hearts it isn't it isn't contrived because i can you know read people pretty well it's not fake it's right. it's just it's really genuine and that's what i really liked about um working in the trenches here yeah. is very genuine and very real that's so good to hear. I know that's something that's very important to Kevin. He doesn't quite view interns in that you know stereotypical way where they're kind of running around filing getting, the paper. getting coffee. And- <laughs> right, it's not like that at all. Like you know, everyone like we're peers here, and I, I know what you mentioned about you know dipping into different programs. I know that's really important. Um, that's actually one of the best parts of our job is as. Yeah, know, communicators is we do get to go between all the programs. Right. You know, I, I, I'm often, I will admit that maybe it's the ADD in me, but, um, I, you know, I, I'm, I don't know if I could ever just work in one program because, you know, I, I'd love the fact that we can touch on right. the vets and, and homeless services right. and everything that we did. In my case, everything related to the parishes and the schools. Yeah, you are all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> but Hard then like that, that you know, how do we work together? How do we integrate these programs to best serve the clients? Like, like you mentioned, Jerry, that's so important because we don't want our programs to be siloed, you know, um, we all have the same mission. So it's like, how can we all work together? And it's a challenge 
you know, but it's it's definitely worthwhile. So I'm, well, that's I think that's kind of brings us back to trauma informed care, right? Is is when when individuals are trauma informed and they're providing services from a trauma informed mindset, it's not possible to be siloed because you're listening to what the need is and you're like, oh, wait a minute. Now that's not my lane, but that is somebody else's mm-hmm. lane. So let me refer you over to Jose if you need furniture right. or, or food or, or something that I'm unable to help you with. There's somebody else that can because you're listening to the story you can meet a greater need. That's such a great point, right? When you when you hear the full story, it's uh, no, you're you and I mean that's maybe that should be what the title of this episode is. Is you know, there's always a story behind the story. Um, but no, it's it's wonderful, and you know, I I think there is a lot to be said for the two of you being having the opportunity to at first intern in your case, Steph, now work here completely because you know places like this, you know, there are lots of social service areas in, in the world, but a, a social service entity like Catholic Charities just allows you a great deal more flexibility uh, in how you can provide services. And, and let's face it, it also provides a lot of inspiration. I mean, we, we talked about, you know, I'm looking over Stephanie's head right now and we have, you know, a bunch of saints that, that we get <laughs> right. to, to look back on and, you know, and, and get Doris Day and Mother Teresa and I can't tell who that one was on the left, but, but, (laughs) um, the, uh, but I mean, it's, it's knowing that there is that spiritual nourishment Mm -hmm. here too. And that's the thing about, uh, Catholic charities. Not everybody here is Catholic, you know, um, I'd say maybe half the staff are Catholic. The other half are just people who believe in that Matthew 25, that, that understand that, you know, we are here to, to serve and help others. Right. Embracing the Catholic social teaching. You don't have to be Catholic to really embrace those values and live them out through your work. And I think it's, it sounds harder, you know, than you look at Matthew 25. We always mention that. Mm -hmm. And it sounds simple, right? Feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the, or visit the imprisoned. And our programs are modeled around that, but you know, it's much more complicated, and that's why it's so great when Kevin plops an article on my desk or an encyclical or a passage and, you know, read this element of Catholic social teach. I mean, it's it's always a learning process. Um, yeah, I don't get the same response when uh, with the attorneys uh, put a lawsuit on my desk and go, <laughs> okay, this is what you're going to need to be aware of. Uh, right. You know, yeah. but but that's the beauty of what chapter, or what chapter <laughs> Chapter. I was about to say chapter 11. Sorry, folks. Uh, if you're wondering, the diocese has been chapter 11 for a little while, so sometimes it skips out. Um, but but it is true that, you know, that, that spiritual nourishment, you know, we talked about, you know, sort of the self-care and things like that. You know, thank God that Kevin Hickey is here and really yes. does encourage that with all the staff and Sylvia Lumeau, mm-hmm. who who understands the having been through the wars, what needs to be done. And, and quite frankly, I, um, let's give Kevin Hickey a little bit of credit. It. He also sees talent, and he knows where where people can be of help to the community at large. So that doesn't surprise me at all that an intern walks through his door and suddenly one of them gets hired and the other one gets like ten things thrown at him because <laughs> because he's not your typical intern. He's he's a, right, right. an intern with a history. Right. So I mean, these are these are good things. Yeah. So I, I hope I hope Mary that you are very proud about oh, working here. You know, I'm. I remember you know, when you I, were just a, a bright-eyed young woman when you first came here. And young woman. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> now I'm bleary-eyed, sleep-deprived. <laughs> yeah, but that's all self-inflicted. Everyone's like, what are you doing for your birthday? I'm like, oh, gosh, I don't know. I just want to nap. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. You are doing Jesus that. naps. But, yeah. You feel like Jesus. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. But Thank has, you, Jerry. It, it is amazing. As someone who, you know, tries to represent Catholic charities, it is so important to look around and, you know, bear witness to what to the work that, that my colleagues do. And, you know, it is something I'm really, really proud of. Now, in our last two minutes, let's talk more about uh, you getting a master's degree. So <laughs> Absolutely I, not. I'm I not really, going down no, no, road. listen, you know, we should mention, you, you we talked about uh, Jerry being from Fordham. You, uh, you went to St. Joe's University, as I did. We both got our bachelor's degrees from there, Jesuit institutions. Uh, we love all of our Catholic colleges, but it is true, Mary and I have an appreciation for the Jesuits, uh, which I th- didn't realize until I actually worked at the diocese right. and realized, oh, wow, my 
brain might be a little wired a little differently than right. some of these folks. Um, but uh, Mary, I really think there's it should much be better things to discuss in the last thirty seconds. We, it's fine. <laughs> How about we okay. give a nice Listen, thank you to, to Stephanie and Jerry who that joined too. Out. But if any Wait, colleges are interested in encouraging oh. Mary, it's Mary McCusker at Camden Diocese.org. <laughs> Feel like free to send your ending. brochures. Because uh, I think she would do great with a uh, master's degree in communications from one of our great Ivy League schools. Oh, my At any rate, gosh. thank you all for listening. <laughs> we really appreciate it. Happy birthday to Mary McCusker. Oh, thank, thank you, you very much for Jerry and Steph for being on today. And to our wonderful listeners, we'll be back to you, with you next week. Talk to you later.